My name is Ken Stressman. I'm the director of the Appellate Advocacy Program at Chicago Kent. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is the final round of the 24th Alana Diamond Wilder Moot Court Competition. Uh, and it is basically a celebration of our school's appellate advocacy program. Uh, our appellate advocacy program exists to train talented students who demonstrate excellence uh, in their early careers in law school and the art and science of appellate advocacy which means it's, it's a, a set of lawyerly skills that combines the down-to-earth practical with the high-end theoretical. There is no area in the practice of law that does more to merge the kind of things that a lot of you are learning in your first year classes with the sort of techniques that are going to matter for you once you graduate uh, from this place. Uh, and you, what you're going to see today are two highly accomplished students who represent 27 highly accomplished members of our appellate advocacy class, who represent 50 members of our appellate advocacy program. Now just a, a quick plug for, for our program and how we operate. One of the things that we do uh, as part of the process of training great law students to be great lawyers is send people out to moot court competitions throughout the United States. Um, and uh, I'm not kidding and I'm not even bragging when I say that our program is, by all sensible, objective measures, uh, consistently one of the best new core programs in the United States. You'll see a long spiel in the program about some of our successes over the last 23 years, and those expand even to last weekend, where for the fourth semester in a row, we won our first foray into national competitions uh, for a uh, semester. Um, so this is an incredibly exciting process and a really, really talented group. So I'm so glad uh, that we get a chance to show you what we're about uh, tonight. Just a little bit about the arguments that you're going to see in the case that you're going to see. This is a simulated argument before uh, a version of the United States Supreme Court. And this is an actual case that's pending in the United States Supreme Court. The oral arguments in a real case are going to be heard by the United States Supreme Court uh, on December 8th, a little bit less uh, than a month from now. Uh, the issues are, they are fundamental issues under the Equal Protection Clause concerning voting rights. About 50 years ago, the United States Supreme Court laid down a principle known as one person, one vote. In a series of cases arising largely out of southern states, what had happened over time in a lot of those states? And it wasn't just the South, it was all over the United States. But over the course of the 20th century, population patterns changed. People moved in large numbers from rural areas to urban areas. Um, but what most states did do <coughs> during that period was attentively redraw their legislative election lines, the lines they used for determining uh, the composition of the state Senate and state legislature. Uh, they didn't redraw those lines. And so what you ended up with is rural areas with relatively small populations being represented by and voting in the same number of state legislators, state senators, and representatives as voters in relatively populous urban areas. So they get sued, claiming a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. And the Supreme Court laid down a series of cases that concluded ultimately that Every person's vote has to be weighed roughly the same as the vote of everyone else in the state. Well, fast forward to 2015. Population dynamics have, have shifted again in states like Texas. The dynamic that we see in states like Texas is large concentrations, primarily in urban areas, of people who are counted in the census population, but who for one reason or another aren't able to vote largely in Texas because there are big pockets of population of documented and not so documented immigrants. Um, and so what has happened as a result of that, arguably, is that the weight of votes in the urban areas has increased dramatically because there are relatively few voters in the population uh, compared to rural areas. So we're seeing what are kind of now, in cases like this one, 
of voting rights analogs to the modern sort of anti so called affirmative action uh, litigation brought under the Equal Protection Clause. So that's what this case is all about. What does one person, one vote mean? What population do you count when you're trying to determine whether an equal protect, uh, protection violation has taken place? So you'll see arguments uh, from the challengers uh, and from the state of Texas. We have a fantastic panel, and they'll give a, a, a realistic test uh, of real world appellate advocacy. So hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope you stick around. After the arguments are over, y'all can head on upstairs to our reception up in the 10th floor. Uh, Morris Hall area. Uh, we've got uh, free food and uh, adult beverages for the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All rise. Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oye, oye, oye. All persons having business before the Honorable Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. And, let's see. and thank you for being here. We're going to be hearing case number 14940, Sue Evenwell et al. versus Greg Abbott, Governor of Texas. And Good afternoon, Ms. Adrian. Good afternoon. You may begin. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Adrian Ajax, and I represent the appellants, Sue and Lyle and Edward Bennington. At this time, I'd like to ask that two minutes be reserved at the end for rebuttal. Of course. Your Honors, one person, one vote is a principle that should be interpreted literally. One person, one vote means that every person, every individual, is entitled to an equally weighted vote, and that is precisely the right that has been undermined by Plan X-172 in Texas. So the, the language that you're asking us to interpret literally, it's, it's not found in the Constitution. That's correct, Your Honor. This is a principle that this Court has developed over time. So was the context in which this court used that language comparable to the context we find ourselves in now? Uh, could you rephrase the question? Well, the context in which we use the language one person, one vote, how would you say that context compares to the situation that Texas is facing today? Well, I think, I mean, I think the language in the one person, one vote principle as articulated by this court sets itself to address the problem we address today. How do we determine what the nature of representation is in each state? Well, you um, have argued that um, the relevant uh, population for uh, one person, one vote purposes is the population of eligible voters as opposed to the full census count. But in a typical, in a typical election, many eligible uh, voters do not vote. Uh, in national elections, for example, only 54% of eligible voters voted in the year 2000, 60% uh, in 2004, 62% in 2008, 57% in 2012. In state elections, those percentages can be even lower. What do those numbers do to your argument? Well, we don't believe they affect our argument at all, Your Honor. I mean, certainly the, the job of the states to ensure that those who have the opportunity to vote have the opportunity to have an equally weighted vote is different from the question of how many people actually participate in any given election. It is not the purview of the states to ensure that everyone actually goes out to exercise this very important constitutional right. Instead, it is the job of the states to make sure that they set a plan, which isn't Plan S-172, 
that ensures that each voter has the right to an equally weighted vote and make sure that the integrity of the vote and thus the, the equal weight of the vote between districts is preserved. Of course, some individual citizens represent the interests of others. Uh, citizens who are not eligible to vote. For example, a mother will likely vote in the interest of her children. A father uh, may uh, vote in the interest of parents who are suffering from dementia. But under your plan, where only eligible uh, voters count, uh, non-parents a vote cast as much as the vote cast on behalf of many citizens, uh, um, you know, the mother and her children, for, 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 for one example. Wouldn't using total population allow for better representation of the interests of citizens that are not eligible or not able to vote? I don't think so, Your Honor. But additionally, states are totally entitled to consider total population data proportionate. What states cannot do is what Texas has done here which in the development of this plan, minus 172, simply ignore the voter data. There were plans available to Texas that would better equalize two metrics, thereby ensuring that the interests of the voter, the interests of the voters in having an equally weighted vote. Well, we currently have some data showing eligible voters, but that's not official census data, is it? Well, citizen voting population Is can, it? No, Your Honor. Right, do we know the margin of error for that data, is it possible that errors in that data could have greater effects on the diluting or overvaluing of votes than the presence of non-citizens in, well, you know, in a district? Certainly, Your Honor, the, the metrics, voter-based metrics are not perfect, but nor is any other metric for that matter. Census data can fluctuate and be very fluid. Voter data can be very fluid as well. The question is, should the states be looking at data that better represents how many eligible voters exist in one district, and thereby draw lines in a way that prevents vote dilution, it prevents a sort of running over of this principle of one person, one vote. So yeah, putting that data uh, aside, how can we write that drawing districts based on the general population is impermissible when the Supreme Court has sanctioned such a method and it is the most common method of drawing districts? Your Honor, indeed, the Supreme Court has sanctioned that over and over again, but they have never heard a case like this where the sanction of total population data and total population as a way of uh, apportioning any given state creates such, such substantial vote dilution if you look at the numbers. I mean, if you refer to page 8 of the record, you can see clearly that in Texas, sure, Texas used a permissible voter metric, they used or, excuse me, total population metric, but indeed the percentages that they created of um, vote dilution be deviations from the ideal range anywhere from 45 to 55 percent. There are many factors that states take into account when they're districting. It's not just uh, total population or, or if they were to take your uh, approach, voting age population, they also take into account boundaries of political uh, subdivisions. They might take into account the Voting Rights Act and its requirements. Uh, if there is not a plan available that meets both the voting age population measure that you're arguing for and allows the state to to uh, to meet to take into account those other factors, what what should happen? Well the states should indeed prioritize those voter numbers. The one person one vote principle is a way of making sure that the integrity of the constitutional right to vote, the fundamental right, is preserved. Now certainly there may be cases where states struggle to put all these factors into one and develop an apportionment plan that best takes into all to account all of these interests. But what we're hoping the court will hold today is that the state needs to consider those voter numbers. Texas simply didn't do that here. Texas had the citizen age voting population data. Texas had this non-suspense non voter registration data. And, and, didn't, and didn't. what if it didn't? What if, what if it's a case where that, that data is, high, is unavailable or highly questionable? Can the state then turn to total population? Not if it's going to diminish the, the weight of votes between districts like Texas has here. Most states do have some ability to calculate the number of age eligible, eligible voters in their districts. This isn't something that is new. It's something that states have had and censuses have had for a long time. What we're saying today is that courts need to take this, or excuse me, legislatures need to take this into account when they go through this process. Indeed, in most cases, as we've seen throughout our precedent, Reynolds versus Sims, Gaffney versus Cummings, usually when a state uses total population proportion, voter population maps onto that pretty evenly. Well, but, mm -hmm. 
But Section 2 of the 14th Amendment seems to direct that federal congressional districts be apportioned by counting the whole numbers of persons within each state. That would seem to be the census number of the whole population. Your argument anticipates that states must apportion state congressional districts according to eligible voter population. I mean, are you contending that states might violate Section 1 of the 14th Amendment by doing the very thing that Section 2 tells them to do in the federal context? In other words, use the whole population? They could indeed, Your Honor. And that's because the federal analogy has been explicitly rejected by this court. Reynolds v. Sims put that to rest very quickly. Constitutional principles govern the apportionment in federal districts for the House of Representatives. But state legislatures are responsible for developing plans for the individual states. What that means is, of course, they have the ability to take into different metrics, take into account different metrics, different factors. You need to each state in the apportionment process. In Reynolds, we said, and I'm going to quote, neither history alone nor economic or other sorts of group interests are permissible factors in attempting to justify disparities from population-based representations. Does that principle help or hurt your argument? Is your scheme based on other sorts of group interests? Well, I think it's based on group interests of this court and has many times reaffirmed that it matters. I mean, I think it helps in the sense that it prevents us from or allowing or endorsing a state to look at impermissible groups as a way of drawing districts in a given state. But Reynolds also said the basic standard of equality among voters is to have an equally weighted vote. This is a basic standard that the court has recognized time and time again. The court has also talked about the different theories of representation as being matters for states to determine. And your argument seems to suggest that non-citizens or citizens who are ineligible to vote, whether due to age or status as felons or whatever, simply don't have a right to representation. Isn't that the logical conclusion of your theory? No, Your Honor. Certainly everyone is entitled to representation. We're not contending that under the Equal Protection Clause everyone is protected. The difference is on what basis should legislatures, legislators, excuse me, be apportioned. Should it be in relation to everyone who, many of whom don't even have a vote? Or should it be on the basis of eligible voters to ensure that their votes are weighted equally in terms of them having equal ability to participate? But if you have a district that has a very high concentration of non-voters and it's apportioned as you suggest, that the legislator who represents that district will be accountable to a much larger number of people than the legislator representing the district that doesn't have that concentration. And so that could affect the nature of representation experienced by the people in the higher density district. Well, I think that's definitely true, Your Honor. But the primary way that people exercise their influence in the political process is through the vote. And that's why this court time and time again has talked about the importance of equalizing the weight of the vote. I mean, certainly people who are non-voters have other ways to sort of make their voice heard and they have the right to petition. Those things aren't going to be taken away by making the states consider voter debt. What is more important than the vote? Excuse me, Your Honor? What is more important than the vote? The right to representation, Your Honor. Is more important than the vote? The vote is one primary way and the primary way to affect change through the political process. You know, as long as the state is not intentionally discriminating, should we not defer to the state's choice of how to draw its districts? Well, we should if they're not invidiously discriminating. But certainly that's what we're seeing in this case. We're seeing the voters being discriminated against based on where they live in the state of Texas. Well, isn't the number of voters an inappropriate basis to use given that voters registration fluctuates in any given election year? Certainly it's not a perfect metric by any stretch. But given the large unauthorized immigrant populations in the state of Texas, certainly voter population, excuse me, total population data is also very fluid as well. That census data is constantly changing too. So none of these metrics are perfect. But that doesn't mean the state is absolved of its responsibility to consider the different voter numbers. Well, how do you distinguish the fact that the Constitution requires states to use total populations in drawing districts for federal congressional seats? Well, I think the primary distinction is that federal apportionment is governed by specific constitutional principles, whereas state legislatures develop their own plans. What that requires is that they make sure that they operate within constitutional bounds when doing so. Now, normally we leave these decisions up to the states. 
And certainly when states have chosen to vote population, usually there's been no issue of indigenous vote dilution and discrimination against rights. Well, but when a state uses some measure other than census data to determine the relevant population, that would seem to allow for more manipulation of the process for political or um, partisan purposes. Won't that just lead to more litigation than uh, using the essentially unassailable uh, official census data? I mean, are courts going to be just mired in suits requiring fact findings about manipulation of eligible voter data if we adopt your approach? Are you going to make us all crazy? I see my time has expired, if I may answer. You may. Certainly, the only thing that's going to give rise to more litigation is if this court doesn't lay down some sort of rule today to resolve this ambiguity. The court has talked again and again about the importance of the equally weighted vote. The weight population fluctuations have given rise to large concentrations of non voting populations mandates that this court say and lay a rule down that says the voter population needs to be considered and given priority in the event of a conflict in the abortion process. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Alex Alaska, and I represent the appellees, the governor and the secretary of state of Texas in their official capacities. Today, we come forward to ask this court to affirm the district court's dismissal for one simple reason, because equalizing total population across a state's legislative districts substantially complies with the Equal Protection Clause. The district court was correct when it noted that states are free to choose their own apportionment base, beyond the requirements that they do so free of invidious discrimination, and that they allocate substantially equal numbers of representatives to substantially equal numbers of persons. Is it possible under the state's apportionment scheme uh, uh, for a minority of uh, the state's electorate to rule over the majority? What does it do? to the democratic process when 5,000 votes are sufficient to elect a representative in an urban dis uh, area, and 10,000 votes are necessary to elect a co-equal representative from a rural area. Well, Your Honor, it does nothing to the democratic process. As you noted several times when you discussed this problem with opposing counsel, Different numbers of persons vote in elections and have done so since the beginning of this country. Now, to say that a person's vote is diluted because it takes more of them to elect a certain representative simply doesn't make sense. But that was, in fact, part of the concern that this court had in Reynolds versus Sims, wasn't it? That's correct, Your Honor. So why doesn't that same, that same principle apply in Texas today? Because the court, this court then found in Reynolds that Equalizing total population is the best way to protect the vote and to protect the equality of each person's vote. Right, but at that time, there, we didn't have the same kind of concentrations of non-voters that we may have today. It was, it was, it could be presumed in a way that we can't presume in all parts of the country today that voting population and general population were basically uh, correlated. Well, Your Honor, we don't have to presume it. 48 of the 50 states already do use total population as their apportionment metric today. But why should a citizen's vote be diluted? Because that citizen lives amongst a large number of lawful permanent aliens, for example. Well, Your Honor, their, their vote wouldn't be diluted. I believe the claimant's claim is that the rural voters would have their votes diluted because there are more voters here. But the fact of the matter is, the state of Texas has chosen between two permissible constitutional apportionment bases. And that was the main holding of Burns versus Sims. In Burns, the court considered how one person, one vote applied to Hawaii's decision to use uh, excuse me, eligible voters as their total population. Well, base. but Hawaii was a very special situation, was it not? Hawaii was similar to the state of Texas in that it used, excuse me, there were largely transient persons that it decided were best able, that, right. that Hawaii's apportionment was best served by looking only to the number of permanent residents who lived in the state. The court said that that was permissible because it was in the state's best interest to represent those persons versus the American military personnel. Well, who could well that is, I mean, it, 
that couldn't, isn't that a recognition that there's a difference between people who have the vote and people who don't in a particular place? Absolutely, Your Honor, but the state of Texas's legislature chose not to make a substantive difference in how those people are represented based off of that distinction. Let's go back to Burns, because in Burns, the district court noted that if total population were the only acceptable criterion on which legislative representation would be, uh, could be based, it would be grossly absurd and disastrous results would flow. Have we reached that point in Texas with the alien residents? Your Honor, we have not. If anything, Why this, not? the circumstances of Texas are certainly unique. The state has the third, the third highest excuse me, population of undocumented immigrants in the country and one of the highest concentrations in its urban area. Well, now, regardless of whether opposing counsel is correct that Texas may be able, able to equalize both voter population and total population, they don't tell you that that's exceedingly likely to result in a violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. But is this not a case where total population figures constitute a uh, substantially distorted reflection of the distribution of state citizenry, which, of course, comes right out of Burns? Well, we're not sure, Your Honor, whether it substantially distorts the state citizenry. In fact, we don't know where the state citizens live, and neither does opposing counsel. The opposing counsel's entire argument is based off of a set of metrics that come from the American Community Survey. Now, if you look to the brief for former and current directors of the U.S. Census Bureau, the American Community Survey is simply a projection of the number of eligible voters or citizens in a certain part of the state. You know, you agree that Texas is unique, do you not? I do. You agree that using total population usually works because total population tracks voter popularity pretty well, don't I you? I do not, Your Honor, and neither does this court. In fact, in Gaffney versus Cummings, the court explicitly stated that districts of equal total population are not always a talismanic measure of the equality of a person's vote. Okay, well, if it doesn't work, then uh, shouldn't we use another method? No, Your Honor, because the critical protection here that the 14th Amendment protects is the right to be equally represented in the legislature. Well, in Hawaii, the state determined that total population was not a good metric to use. Shouldn't Texas have reached the same conclusion here? No, Your Honor, that was the result of the deliberative and the legislative process of the state's legislature. Does, now, yeah, d does the record tell us how many more non-citizens live in the United States now than when these apportionment cases were decided in the 1960s and 1970s, the court in that era seemed to have been treating the term population as synonymous with, uh, with citizens and voters. If those groups are no longer analogous, um, why continue to use population as a substitute for eligible voters? Because, Your Honor, using total population was designed to rectify the evils that led to the Civil War, and it was in fact the reason that the 14th Amendment was adopted and ratified by the states in the Reconstruction era. Prior to the 14th Amendment, the Constitution counted African Americans as three-fifths of a person, in effect saying that because of who you are and because of the government's refusal to recognize you as worthy of equality that every other person receives, you will not receive equal representation in the legislature. Well, if we have the technology to determine the distribution of voters, shouldn't we take advantage of that to make each voter's uh, vote equal? Or quite simply, Your Honor, we don't have the technology. The American Community Survey is a projection. It's based off of a very small sample size. And as the directors of the Census Bureau note in their briefs, it is not well suited to the finite task of drawing districts. Now, when you draw districts, you need hard numbers because sometimes the district lines change from one block to another block especially in highly dense urban areas. Projections of the amount of voters or citizens or non-citizens in an area simply are not as reliable as they need to be when constructing districts based off of either equal total population or voter population. In fact, that's the reason the court has always ordered that districts be constructed on the basis of the U.S. Census data. Well, well isn't the purpose of the one person, one vote doctrine to prevent vote uh, dilution, such as the vote dilution that's occurring in Texas? It's intended to protect vote dilution, but vote dilution is not occurring in Texas, Your Honor. The court found that districts of unequal total population were unconstitutional primarily because they did not allow equal numbers of persons to be equally represented in the legislature. 
So I want to ask you about this equal representation Certainly. idea. The, would this mean that a non-citizen or a non-eligible voter in a district would have standing to challenge an apportionment plan on the basis that, that they weren't equally represented? Likely not a constitutional claim here, but Your Honor, but the fact of the matter is, if there was a concern, there would be other methods, likely statutory methods, of bringing that matter into court. Well, but if, if the, what's being protected is, uh, is equal representation, is that equal representation somehow more meaningful for people who are able to vote and people who aren't? giving rise to a difference in whether or not they can sue over the, the district lines? It's not more or less meaningful. It's simply that the right to vote, and usually, excuse me, the dilution of a right to vote usually involves a more tangible or a more concrete harm than would a dilution in the right to equal representation. Well, would, but if state, look, if state resources are allocated by district, then the state's apportionment scheme means that districts containing large numbers of non-citizen residents will receive the same resources as districts comprised mostly of citizens. So, I mean, is that a harm? Is that a fair result? Not at all, Your Honor. In fact, that's exactly what the state's legislature is attempting to do. Not, equally... not at all what? It's not at all a harm, I'm sorry. It's not a harm because the state's legislature has determined that regardless of a person's citizenship status, they deserve equal access to their representatives, to police and fire services, to things like driving on roads and receiving the benefits of everyone's tax dollars. To be honest, the nature of, of a Republican form of government is not such that only voters are able to access or petition the government. I'd like for this court to imagine a hypothetical situation. Think of a state legislator who begins a town hall meeting, but before he answers any of his constituents' questions, he first subjects them to a battery of questions. Are you a state citizen? Are you a United States citizen? Are you eligible to vote? Did you vote at all? And then changing his answer or otherwise not answering their question at all, depending on their response. But that could happen anyway. I mean, the, the, the legislator is going to be most interested in pleasing the voters, regardless of what the makeup of his or her district is. That's correct, Your Honor, but I don't believe it's likely that based off of those persons' responses, that the legislature would the legislator would refuse to answer or otherwise change his answer. Because state legislators know that when they go cast a vote in the legislative body, they do so on behalf of their entire constituency, regardless of whether those persons are eligible to vote, whether they voted at all, or whether they voted for that legislator. In fact, as Your Honors noted, oftentimes, many people don't vote, sometimes as high as 45%, even more, in statewide elections. Now, I'd like to turn back for a moment to the text of the 14th Amendment, because it governs here today, and I believe it's important to look there first. As Your Honors noted earlier, Section 2 explicitly requires a, the apportionment of federal congressional districting schemes on a total population basis. This is in line with the fundamental principles of a Republican government, of a representative government. This country was not based off of a limited democracy, such as the appellant's content, that would extend the right to vote and be represented simultaneously to only those people who are citizens or meet a certain threshold requirements as admitted by the state. Appellants offer a reading of the first section of the 14th Amendment that says not only that equalizing total population is not obligatory, but is unconstitutional. This is simply well, isn't there a position that it's unconstitutional to the without considering uh, voter population? They may say that, Your Honor, but the real at bottom at bottom this case is the intersection of a claim to electoral equality versus a right to representational equality. The claimants here would have us use is there either some level of of disproportionality in voting population that would give rise to a claim? I mean, is there, is, if it was, is, does, it, does, it, does there have to be any consideration at all of how extreme the disparities are? I believe it would be a wise policy consideration to do so, but I do not believe it creates a constitutional violation. If this court meant for districts of equal total population to produce districts of equal voting power, it would have said so in much more concrete terms than in any of the language in the Reynolds versus Sims or one vote, one, one person, one vote project. Now, the 14th Amendment was predicated on a government that equally represents all persons, regardless of their status. But if an urban vote 
counts more than a rural vote. How is there equality of voting power? Because the critical, well, there's not, Your Honor, but the critical protection is the right to the equal representation in the legislature. Now, when approximately 811,000 people in each district under Plan S-172 influence their legislators, they do so on an equal footing across the state and without regard to whether they are citizens or non-citizens or voters or non-voters. This is what James Madison urged in the Federalist Papers. It is what the Texas Attorney General in 1981 opined that led to the amendment of Texas's Constitution from an exclusive voter population base to a total population base. And it is what the state and governor, of, excuse me, the legislature and governor of Texas were intending to achieve when they enacted a plan that equalizes total population across each district. A Republican form of government is the guarantee of this country, and it always has been. And we've been figuring out the best way to do it since, as shown by the amendments, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the 19th and the 25th. This is a process, and the state is getting there. While we may not be perfect just yet, we have achieved equality of representation that is the fundamental and core principle of our representative government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, I have one quick point on rebuttal. Your Honor has discussed with opposing counsel Burns versus, Burns versus Richardson whether or not Texas has gotten to a similar point in terms of very largely skewed uh, voter data and problems within voter apportionment schemes. Indeed, we have reached that point in Texas. But in, in Burns, didn't the court say that part of its upholding of Hawaii's plan was that it basically also tracked population distribution? It did, Your Honor, but that was actually citizen population and not total population. Your Honors were correct in suggesting that a comparison of the voter data uh, as compared to the total population data in the state of Hawaii, if that was to be the basis on which the plans were to be drawn, that that would be to absurd results. Indeed, we have reached a similar position here in Texas. This is, if we don't solve this question now. But I think that your opposing counsel was trying to make the point that we want our legislators to think about the people in their districts regardless of whether or not they can vote. We want our legislators to be aware of those people's problems as well. If a, if a legislator is representing a district that is significantly larger in population because of the, the voting age distribute, uh, apportionment you're describing, doesn't that make that person's job more difficult? I don't think so, Your Honor. Certainly, the, the right for everyone to be represented still is maintained by what we're suggesting today. We're merely asking the legislators consider uh, voter data and prioritize that in the event of a conflict. Again, Texas had all the plans on the table to be able to um, better equalize these two metrics, but chose not to. There's no rational reasons for them not to. And given that this problem could only get worse in places well, like Well, they, they've articulated a rational reason, which is Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Isn't that a good enough reason? Well, they were articulated the reason, Your Honors, that, that this is sort of a legislative process, that this is a calculated decision on the part of Texas. But it's not a decision that best upholds the interests of voters, those that have the tangible, secure right to a vote, the primary way with, with, through which people influence the legislative process. That is the uh, right that needs to be protected. And uh, Plan S-172 must be struck down for those reasons. Thank you. Thank you very much. to both of you, and the case will now be taken under advisement. All rise.